Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press. And let's say hello to our guest, Mr. Dimola Kimbola, the publisher of The Podium Medium. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today again. All right. Um, let's start with the Daily Trust newspaper. The headline says, Nigerians groan as cooking gas price keeps soaring. Marketers blame Forex, VAT, low supply. LNPC says will soon increase supply. Above that headline on the Daily Trust, Erufai mocks Southern governors, says anti-open grazing law not implementable. Nigeria sells $4 billion euro bond. It will ease pressure on the Naira. Northern elders say how Buhari's successor should emerge. Also, restructuring Jagasic scrapping of 24 states. COVID-19 eroded 20% full-time jobs in 2020. That's according to the MBS. And lastly, bandits outnumber security personnel. That's a statement by Masari. And the governor and emir tells FFG, eliminate them at all costs. All right. Let's move to the nation newspapers. Big one there says, anti-open grazing, El Rafai attacks southern governors. They're making political law that can't be implemented, he says. Um, aggrieved or your PDP members plan parallel Congress. And also bearer for Unubisi Kanu on the 16th of October. Still on the nation this morning, agency says 1.8 million people fully vaccinated in Nigeria. Jaga Utomi and others float Rescue Nigeria project. It's an interesting conversation. Buhari six removal of ministers from NNPC limited board. And also, um, NBS report, 20% of Nigerians lose jobs to COVID-19. Government raises $4 billion euro bonds to finance 2021 budget. And on a uh, value-added tax controversy, uh, uh, says VAT uh, controversy lingers. Multiple cases create uncertainty over collection and sharing of August remittance. Also, Nigeria security threat complex, says the IG. Finally, Oshun makes 19 billion naira from internally generated revenue. Let's take a look at the leadership newspaper. 36 days after Ascent's PNB six amendment to PIA says act makes no provision for federal character, political appointees as board members, ignores outcry over 3% for host communities, nominates board members for upstream regulatory commission, EFCC others, experts react. Tension in Kotangura over selection of new emir. Flood displaces several families in rivers. Corporate bodies, security agencies endorse editors' conference. PDP convention, Ali, Nwodu, Mwazo, others warn against imposition. Oshimbajo here says and tells African leaders that our Nigeria's youth must be given jobs. Northwest governors engage 3,000 vigilantes to combat banditry. Senate moves life imprisonment for kidnappers. And now on the Daily Independent, Jaga Ahmed Duke Utomi lead move to upstage the APC government. Say nepotism, lack of exclusiveness gave rise to agitations, lamenting security, collapse of economy despite claim of uh, GDP rise. Anti-open grazing laws on unenforceable, Erfai tells Southern governors. Says Kaduna, uh, 10 billion Naira Kato Ranch will be ready in two years. Delta Assembly passes anti-open grazing bill. Also 2023, ceding presidency to North, dangerous for Nigeria's unity, says Ishe Sage. Libel's uh, NAF spokesman Baba Ahmed, Northern Irredentist. Senate considers life imprisonment for kidnappers. Proposes 30-year jail term for ransom collection. And also why Chinese company abandoned work on uh, new... Uh, terminal at Lagos Airport. Federal government frowns at people trying to get COVID-19 vaccination cards without jab. And also, again, federal government plans to register new mobile phones before use. Uh, Buhari writes National Assembly, Sixth Amendment to Petroleum Industry Act. And um, I think one other here, Sanus experience uh, to stop cursing leaders because of hardship. Mr. Kimbola, good morning to you. Um, I think I would love uh, us to start with the uh, new movement by Atahiru Jega, Patutomi, Donald Duke, and uh, I'm not sure which Ahmed this is 
Um, it is called the Rescue Nigeria Project. So let's start with that. I think this is like clockwork. We have this every four years. Um, how do you, <laughs> how would you take this one? Um, I was simply say, here we go again. Um, each time we get close to the election, some form of uh, a loose association springs up, threatening to challenge the status quo. But unfortunately, experience has shown that at the end of the day, disagreements, oversharing of positions, ideologies, and stuff like that often scored to such plan. Mm -hmm. um, I believe this is too late for 23. Uh, if we're going to set a, um, if we're going to be serious about a rescue Nigeria project through the political process, then we should be working towards 2027. 2023, positions have been taken, resources have been mobilized. Mm -hmm. I do not know what they can do in the next three years. And um, it will take them time actually to bring on board a lot of people, game changers, I call them, in the political landscape. It will take them a lot of time to convince them to come on board. So, so I think for 2023, we are stuck with APC, PDP. We've always said they are the same, and um, we just have to make do with one of them. Uh, I agree and I support the initiative for a third um, platform, which will be different from what we are used to. Uh, but I also know that in Nigeria, the reality of the situation is that political parties, political platforms cost a lot of money. A lot of money. And if these guys are not careful, they're going to bring on board people, strange bedfellows, ideological strange bedfellows, and that would definitely scuttle whatever dream that they have. So in theory, it's a good idea that should be worked upon against 2027 because we need to impact on Mexican mobilization across the country. But if you ask me, do we need an alternative to APC, PCP? Yes, we do. Is we it really also, need, is, need an alternative. Yeah, is yes. it also interesting seeing Atahiru Jaga as uh, one of the pioneers yeah. of this movement? Yes. It, 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 I mean, I was shocked. I was shocked. That, like they would say in the, in, the, in the local street palace of Nigeria, it shocked me seeing Jaga there um, consider the role he played just recently uh, as INEC chairman. And you begin to wonder, isn't there something in his contract that should have prevented him from going into active politicking, maybe within five, ten years of leaving office? That I think we should consider because he, he, he comes with a lot of insight into how the electoral process works, okay? And whether these insights are going to be used um, to the detriment of the country or not, it, it is something that, 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 that needs to be looked into. But yes, he is welcome. The Constitution allows him. And uh, let's see how it goes. But really, uh, yeah, I look at all of the people there. What political weight do they carry? How many of them can win elections in front of their police uh, polling booths? Mm. Okay, so politics in Nigeria, it, it, it's, it's funny uh, because the way it's structured, whether we like it or not, is still cash and carry. It's unfortunate, but that's the truth. You need a lot of money to mobilize, mobilize it. In this case, means giving voters money to vote for you. Mm. It, it's not something we should be proud to say, but that is the sad reality of our political system. So where these guys are going to be able to amass enough war chest, enough resources to fight APC, PDP, between now and then, that it is good for us to have this discussion, let it be going on, okay? But we do not need to form SRP before we know that we need an authority to APC, uh, uh, PDP. Don't forget in 2015 or so, we had, uh, so that the Rotary, we had OP, all of them yes. coming together, but it never worked. Why? Because they brought together people who had different ideologies. Okay. So maybe the leftist, maybe it, it, the, the time has come for us to have a leftist political party. Because basically APC, PDP, we can we see them as conservative, rightist party. We need a genuinely leftist party to look at issues from a different perspective. So in theory, yes, it's a welcome idea uh, okay. that we should, but we should look at 2027. Okay. Really. Okay, so another big story that we've really talked about for a long time and even over a decade is the Petroleum Industry Act. Um, the good thing yeah. how this all scales through, but um, 
One of the challenges regarding this is the outcry by host communities over the 3% um, that they were to get. They were really pushing for this to be increased and there were conversations about the amendment, you know, amendment to the PIA to give those host communities a bigger share of the cake. But um, 36 days after the ascent of this PIA, on the daily, the leadership newspaper says that President Mohamed Buhari has written um, to the Senate seeking amendments to that act. And the amendments he's talking about here really is about um, his intentions to increase the number of, of people, the membership of the board of the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Regulatory um, Authority. So people are saying here yeah. that um, it seems that the priorities of the president is misplaced. His amendment, the amendments that he's seeking um, regarding the PIA are simply political regarding, um, you know, membership of boards. And that the thing that really has been hurting the people regarding, you know, what they should get, the president ha has remained silent about that. So I want to get your, your thoughts regarding um, the PIA and the amendments. Okay. Now, some people have said this government is deaf. And what the president has done by seeking this so-called amendment confirms that notion that this government is truly deaf and insensitive to the yearnings of the people. I would have thought a listening government would see this as an opportunity to take this bill back to the National Assembly, organize stakeholder consultations across the country, incorporate all of the objections the concerns of the host communities and let the bill be redebated all over again. Mm -hmm. And of course, we said this National Assembly is the, is, is the I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on, on, I'm on uh, live TV and uh, sometimes I, I get constrained by the words I use. But really, this National Assembly is the most irresponsible, it's the most irresponsible as far as I'm concerned. It is unrepresentative of the wishes of the people. Okay? Everywhere that this bill has been discussed, people have come out to make to, to, to register serious objections. If the bill is going back to the Senate, I will have expected this to say, guys, this is the good opportunity we have to right the wrongs of the previous bill. This is the opportunity we have to go back to our constituent units and ask them again for their input and how do we factor in this input into this new bill. Because for me, it's like we are starting all over again. Mm. If it took us over 19 or 20 years to get to this stage, then we, we better get it right. Okay. We better get it right. It's, 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 it's an opportunity for us to right the wrongs. We did say when this bill was signed that a lot of loose threads are still angry. Mm. So by providence, the president is taking the presidential assembly. For God's sake, the Senate should not just rubber stamp the amendment the president is seeking. The National Assembly should take its time to incorporate all of the concerns of the communities because these are not frivolous concerns. These are very valid and legitimate concerns that need to be looked into. Okay. So I'm happy that we have the will of opportunity to take another look at this bill, but we should not waste this opportunity because once the window is closed again, we will end up having a law that the stakeholders or those who are meant to benefit from it, they are not proud of it, they are not going to support it. At the end of the day, it will be 20 or 21 years wasted. So it's an opportunity that we must maximize to incorporate all of those um, amendments that people are suggesting. All right, now let's move to um, well, another very, very big story that has uh, you know, been across the country in the last yeah. few weeks, and that is the anti-open open grazing bill. The governor of Kaduna yeah. State, um, is in the news on The Nation this morning. It says uh, uh, anti-open grazing, Elrofi attacks southern governors, saying that the bill is not implementable. Um, and whatever it is that they are doing in their state houses of assembly might be a waste of time. Um, what are your views on this? I would have loved Elrofi to tell us what he meant by the bill is not implementable. If properly constituted political structures uh, as represented by the House of Assemblies, if they debated, according to the constitution and they have come up with laws that governors have signed. Every fair cannot sign Katuna and telling them that it's not implementable. If each state doesn't want to go in that direction, that's fine. And it calls to question the point made about the structuring. I do hope we will have time to discuss facts also. Unless we go back and reveal the constitution, we are just talking and clowning around. 
That is the basis of all these disagreements. We do not have the country. We, do, we, we have a loose federation made up of states okay, jostling for economic and political power. We do not have a country. So the constitution needs to be revisited. And if what will help us is for, for us to go back to regionalism, so be it. Definitely, what we have today is not working. It's not working. Elrufai can afford to say what he's saying. This is a man that so much has happened under his nose there. Children being kidnapped every day as if, they are not, as if there's no body respect. And you come up to say, what other governors of coordinate status like uh, as, 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 as yourself, what they have taken their time to agree upon is not implementable. I think the one that will tell them what is implementable. Anybody who has any objection should go to the Supreme Court. Statements like that are reckless. They do not help the cause of the unity of the country. And I, I think it was just played to the gallery, quite frankly. Okay. Um, on the Nation newspaper, still on the screen, there's a story on the top left um, corner. It says MBS reports 20% Nigerians lose jobs to COVID-19. So the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and the National Bureau of Statistics, MBS, came together um, to, you know, release an assessment of the COVID-19 impact on businesses in the year 2020. They discovered that lots of businesses have been shut and they've not been able to open since then. And that lots of people have really gone out of jobs. Basically, um, the way the leadership newspaper put it is that two of 10 employed Nigerians are out of jobs in the year 2020. Uh, Mr. Akimola, yes, you're not in Nigeria, but you follow the news and you understand what it is like for many people here in the country. So how would you say, you know, is your own assessment of the impact of COVID-19 on businesses in the country? I, I disagree with the term that um, has been used here. If you're talking about businesses being, being impacted seriously by COVID-19, yes. Talk about employment, I'm not aware that the federal government will retrain staff. I'm not aware that state governments in uh, uh, retrain staff. So we're talking about, yes, the ability of the average Nigerian to do his or her business to make money has been impacted. 20%, I, I, I do not know how they are ever that figure. But the truth that we cannot shy away from is the fact that all over the world, COVID-19 has slowed down economic recovery developing countries what? even in developing countries even in the u.s yeah really uh, Mr. Kimbala, aside the uh, government yes. employment what about private workforce uh, for companies who couldn't yes. continue to pay salaries or continue to thrive that 20 percent might yeah. you know, fall under under that um, spectrum it's not impossible Actually, Mr. Possible. Akimola, it's the MBS I mean, report says yes. that this really wasn't focused on, on, on government. You know, we never mentioned the government. It's about private enterprises so in not, Nigeria. Then, and the report then, says that it interviewed okay. over 3,000 businesses from both the formal and informal, informal sectors. So that's what the report is saying. Okay, so that headline by the nation is misleading because when you talk about employment, employment in the, in the strict sense of it means paid employment. But let's leave that aside. That doesn't still take away from the fact that COVID-19 has affected a lot of people all over the world. And for the U.S. economy, the saving grace has been that the government has been able to come to the rest of the people. Yeah. I think so far there have been about four or five um, checks that have been given to families to help them cushion the effects. So yes, um, COVID-19 has, has, has done a lot of damage. Okay. It, it, it's really affected a lot of economies and um, unfortunately, in the German government, that is about it. Palliatives, we all recall how the warehouses were looted, how people um, have been stored, what was meant for the entry of the people. Okay, so, yes, that report may not be 100% accurate, but it doesn't take away from the fact that a lot of businesses in Nigeria were impacted uh, because of any capacity was seriously hampered, and of course, salaries being delayed. And because of our uh, pension for not keeping records, actually, this figure may actually be higher. From the private sector, a lot of companies might have retrained quite a lot of money. So it, it, it's, it's something that um, uh, we shouldn't completely throw away for lack of accuracy, but it's a development that's wholesome, and we should plan. Okay, next time it may not be COVID 19, it will be something else that will not allow businesses to operate at full capacity. How are we going to provide a safety net for the people? Okay.
All right. Short short and, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Kimball, another thing, uh, another story um, in the papers this morning on the Daily Independent, top right corner, um, it's talking about the 2023 presidency, this time by, you know, I believe a former friend of the current administration, Ishe Shage, um, SAN. He says, ceding presidency to North, uh, dangerous for Nigeria's unity. Um, so I want you to quickly respond to that. It also says that he labels NEF spokesperson, Baba Ahmed, uh, a Northern irredentist. Um, there have been, you know, a couple of these conversations lately on, you know, whether there yeah. should be proper zoning arrangement, if a southerner <laughs> should be let, you know, to, you know, take over presidents in 2023, maybe also to the southeast and some of all of that. But it just, I guess, says yeah. it is dangerous uh, to cede it to the north once again. Yeah, of course. I mean, going by what this person actually said yesterday, it's very obvious that the southern part of the country is not in the mood to allow the North to continue to uh, uh, hold on to the presidency. And it, it, it's a moot point. If the North has had eight years, why should the South not have its own term? Mind you, I am not an advocate of rotation of presidency. I will have not a merit based approach. But the sad reality of the current situation is that everything has to be done by federal character, it has to be done by term by term. One of the amendments the president is seeking. So the PIA Act is that it doesn't make room for federal character. And so it, it means we are still stuck with this non factor side divide. And uh, Professor Sage is just saying the obvious. Everybody in the South wants power to come back to the South. Eight years of the North, this is where we are as a country. Let's try this out. And if that's going to state where the government has come out openly to say, look, if any of the parties picks a Northern candidate, the South will not vote. Mm. The governors might as well be echoing popular sentiment across their state. On the streets of Lagos, Ibadan, and Kure, the whole of South South, people are saying it's time for us to have a South South and a South South president. So, at the end of the day, the two parties will have their conventions, will have their primaries, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But it's also symptomatic of the sickness of the disease that is plaguing the political landscape. After 61 years, they are going whether the north or the south. I would have thought the two parties would say, look, Nigeria is in dire straits. Nigeria is blazing. Let's look for the best man for the job, whether it's coming from the north or the south. That is kind of discussion or conversation I want us to be having at this point, considering how bad things are. Okay? So if the south says it must be a certain president, and at the end of the day, we can't find someone who says this, but after we say, oh, because it's our turn, we have to put someone there. So, but like someone also said, if it's not, you will find competent people, and the South will find competent people. So, taking off from that premise, I, 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 I think the parties should go to the Prime Minister and have a very transparent, the very open, but everybody should be encouraged to be part of the process, whether you are from the North. Or from the south, everybody should go in there and let the popular candidate in mind. Then the electorals will now be left to do the job. Like I said at the beginning, there's no difference between the APC and PDP. So at the end of the day, we are voting for. I mean, whether APC or PDP, they are the same. So if we have another candidate from APC, South candidate from, from PDP, it doesn't really matter whether it's for the party who voted for the candidate. So a lot of sentiment will go to the next election. Okay. Um, I want you to give us your thoughts regarding this uh, issue on the Senate. It says, Senate considers life imprisonment for kidnappers and then proposes 30 years jail term for ransom collection. So in, even those who go ahead to pay ransom um, would get some jail term and those who kidnap people would get some jail term. Um, do you think this should um, have any effect in curbing you know, the menace of kidnapping and insecurity in Nigeria? Or do you think we should just tackle the issue? And on the other hand, beyond passing these views into law, talking about implementation. Well, uh, I, I have a slightly modified view of this. I would have said, if you kidnap and your victim dies in the process, you should face the firing squad. Mm. Okay, uh, sometimes you need to come up with capital punishment to address lingering um, problems in society. If you kidnap and your victim 
you have killed. Because you should also die. If you kidnap and your victim is rescued, then go for life in prison. I do not think those who pay ransom should, should punish. Hey, it, it's a failure of the system that people are agreeing to pay ransom. The police will come out and say, oh, no ransom was paid, but that's not the truth. 95% of rescued, killed, kidnapped victims, people paid ransom. But of course, they want to keep it out of the press. So if people, if, if, if you now want to punish those who are paying ransom, then how do you want them to rescue their victims? Because it has become evidently clear that the, the state cannot save people. Kidnappers are on the rampage. Mass are insane. Bandits are outnumbering security personnel. I've never heard that before. Mm. Okay, so it, it, it means even governors are helpless. And so if people need to pay ransom to rescue their loved ones, so be it. Yeah. They should be spared. But the kidnapper and the associate should face the full wrath of the law. Okay. My view. All right. Um, I think you can also quickly share your thoughts on the Nigerian government raising $4 billion euro bonds uh, to finance the 2021 budget. Uh, quickly share your views on that one. Yeah, it, it's, it's, on it's the nation that is the inevitable. Well. Um, one, it's it, 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 it a good development. It means the investors, foreign investors still have confidence in the economy. Um, critics are going to say, keep borrowing, keep borrowing. We don't have to borrow because we're not making money. I don't know to finance your budget. We have so many things to look at that budget. I don't know to finance them. Income has dwindled. Here we are, and you have tax collection. Okay, so a, a lot of things. COVID 19 also has affected government ability to earn. So there's no way government will not borrow. But what we'll be saying is that when you borrow, spend that money on things that will yield benefits that will lead to development. Don't borrow. To pay political office holders, don't borrow to fund elections, don't borrow um, and, and freak it away on, 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 on productive stuff. Borrow to, to fund infrastructure development that will lead to revenue generation. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it, it, it's okay to borrow as long as you are, you are borrowing in a sensible way. So it's a good development, four billion, a lot of money. One only hope that this money is to put to use, it's not. Um, we can have the strict monitoring of the projects that are going to be used to fund. So it's a work on development, as far as I'm concerned. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Ademola Akimola, this morning. I wish we had enough time to actually talk about the story um, on the Daily Independence that says um, Sanusi from my of Kano is asking Nigerians to stop cursing leaders because of hardship and instead pray for them and have hope. But sadly, we don't have enough time to go into that. But thank you very much for coming on the breakfast this morning. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Have a lovely day. You too, sir. Thank you. So we're going to show a break here and return for Today in History. Stay with us.